Is there? Um, yeah, it, if, if you're playing it right, the house advantage is less than 1%. Just to give you a, 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 a quick idea of what house odds and true odds are, um, you've got roulette, for example, where you've got numbers 0 to 36. If you put a chip and you hit it on the nose, you'll get the odds of 35 to 1. Yes. Now, there's 37 numbers on the board. And that's the difference between house odds, which is 35 to 1, and true odds, which is 37 to 1. Mm. And that's how the casino makes, makes its money. Um, and every game is edged in towards the casino favourite, pays house odds. Now, right. most, most games, such as Roulette and all the others, are, are between 1 and 5% house advantage. But the biggest rate is slots. Um, as one of your previous callers said, it's, it's, around, it's around 90%. So the casino will take 10%, 10%. of every pound that you put in. Every spin, it'll be, it'll take out 10p. Which is one hell of a profit. Absolutely, yeah. It is, it is, it is not a bad margin. Um, the, the only problem with running an online casino to a real casino is, if it's a real casino, people can walk in the door, and it's a lot of effort to go out, walk down to another casino, where online, everything's just a click away. And that's one of the reasons why, why we got out of it. But the main hook for, for us was people that were, um, w that were chasing. Did you get into it because you're a gambler? Um, uh, yes. I, I had had a, a flutter. And I did at one point also have a problem with fruit machines. Using uh, the word gambler, I don't mean that as insult because I have a bet, therefore I'm a gambler. Uh, but I'm not an addictive gambler, I'm not a compulsive gambler, I'm an occasional gambler only when I feel like it and when I can afford it. So there's no insult in the word gambler. Uh, no, I mean, I think if you, if you do it sensibly, gambling is not, is not a dirty word. It, it, it's there to have a bit of fun and it's there as a pastime. And you might, you might win a bit of money, you might lose a bit of money, but as long as you've had a good time and you can afford to lose it, which I think is the key, is it, it, it's entertainment. Oh, uh, I no doubt yeah, in my mind, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I have been to Vegas before, and I have really enjoyed it, and that was one of the reasons... See, now, I would never in a million years go to Vegas. It just, it's a city set up, as I understand it, to gambling and nothing else. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 let's face it, everybody built Vegas. You know, it, 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 it erodes out of people's money. Yeah. It's the only place you can go, give all your money and get nothing in return. I, I can't think why I would want to go there. I, mean, I, I know I wouldn't want to go there. But I can understand those who do. Yeah. But they're not the sort of people that I would normally expect to be associated with. I don't mean that rudely. <laughs> sure. But it just seems to me that if you're an addictive gambler, waking up in the middle of Las Vegas must be like waking up in heaven. Absolutely. I mean, again, the thing there is when you're in the casino, uh, they've got no windows, they've got no clocks, you don't know what time it is, you've got complimentary... complimentary food drinks. is free, isn't it? Food is free, drinks are free, and if you play enough, your rooms are free. Um, and I, 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 rumour has it, I don't know how true, that it, true this is, but they actually pumped in rich daring, which keeps you awake and keeps you, um, keeps you going, basically. Oh, I'm sure that happens. No trick will be missed when the profits are that big. Absolutely. Nick, thank you very much for the call. I mean, 704-2020-20 is our number. Uh, we're going to Huddersfield. Martin's there. Martin, good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Hi, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion, a theory. People say that when you go to cinemas, a film is better to watch because you're moving your head from left to right. What about the flashing lights on these machines? Are they geared up to make the brain respond in a certain way? Uh, you know, I, I wondered that myself. I don't know. Yeah, because, I mean, when you go to opticians and you get your eyes tested, they actually use flashing lights, like now you see. And you sometimes hear warnings on TV of flashing lights because people have epileptic. Oh, yeah, epileptic, yeah. But if you get a simpler example for me, is when you go around your supermarket, Yeah. when you get near the bread counter, you can smell freshly baked bread. Yeah. When you get near the fish counter, you can smell a sort of an ozone, a, a sort of a, a fishy smell, a sea yeah. type smell, and, and so on. Yeah. And when you get near the counter that does fried chicken or whatever it does, you can smell chicken. Yeah. Now, none of those smells are real. Yeah. All of those smells come from a, a machine which pumps out those smells. Another thing you missed, yeah, exactly, um, I do hear what you're saying. Another thing you missed out is like, when you get attuned to these machines and you go into certain places, you know, oh, you've got out of here, you know how these machines work, you know, they, they want to know you if you don't know how the machines work. But when you get an idea how the machines work, they don't want to know you. There's another factor in that, and I wish I'd have taken out with the guy from the casino. I got thrown out of a casino in London for card counting. <laughs> Now, I'd never been there before in my life. I'd never go there again. I was taken there by a friend because I was having a particularly horrible day. 
And he said, oh, come on, cheer yourself up, let's go to the casino. I'd never, except for the one in Monte Carlo, where I went for other reasons, I'd never been in the casino in my life before. And I was, uh, he would encourage me to play, and the, he knew the people that were there, and they encouraged me to play. And I was watching the cards, because I, I like playing cards. And the guy came over to me after about three games, and he said, uh, can you come with me, sir? I said, certainly. And I thought, you know, they, you know, they want to give me some money or something. And yeah. um, we walked to the door, and he gave me my coat, and I pushed me outside. It and I said, I said, what, 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 he said you were card counting. I said, well, so what? He said, it's illegal. I mean, how can it be illegal mm. to count the number of cards exactly. that are being played out in a hand? Have you ever seen Rain Man? Because, I mean, there's a theory that some people have a dis a dis thought, uh, an, uh, an illness where they can actually count things. Um, no, I I've not seen Rain Man. Well, you know, but they can actually count cards and numbers because it's a, dis it's a disorder that they have. Yeah. And they can automatically attune themselves to count things automatically. But I was doing it deliberately. I wasn't even pretending not to. Yeah. I mean, I, I was, I watched where, you know, each card came in the pack and I watched the way it was shuffled and dealt. And I was counting the cards as they were played. So I had a fairly good idea that a certain run of cards was going to come up at a certain particular point in the game. Yeah. Which is the whole point in counting the cards. Yeah, they want to know you when you don't, when, when you don't know these things. When you get attuned to them, they don't want to know you. So no, I, mean, I, was, I was literally thrown out. Um, and I was told it's illegal. I, I'm still, I wish I'd have checked that. Martin, thank you for the call. Maybe somebody can advise me on that. If you know about the law and gambling, there's not much law connected with gambling. And I'm amazed that um, there can be an illegal act with regard to counting cards. Surely you get every advantage you can without cheating. That's not cheating, to count the card. I wouldn't cheat for a million quid. I really wouldn't cheat at anything. And if I'd have thought that was cheating, I wouldn't have done it. But it seemed logical to me that you count the number of cards. You know, there are 52 in the pack. You know how many people have been dealt. You know how many cards are coming around. You see how often the picture cards and the... The ace is coming round, and you, you count, and you think, I know where that one will be. You don't know precisely, but you've got a fair idea. Um, that's what I was doing. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Won't be going again. Oh, it's 704 That's the number. And uh, Brian is in Newcastle. Brian, good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Mm, hello there, Mike. Hi, Hi, Brian. I'm very similar to yourself, Mike. Um, you know, I like to play for better on the horses occasionally, or... Maybe go on to the Greyhounds and put a few pounds on there, but apart from that, I've got no interest in slot machines whatsoever. No. You know, you know, because you, like other people have said, they can be like fiddled with or whatever. But when you put some money in a horse, you know, you can you can always. Well, it's an animal. It's a real thing. It's part yeah. of a sport. There's no sport in a fruit there. machine. Sorry, Mike. There's no sport in a fruit machine. No, not so. It's mean, a mechanical device. Yeah, I mean, I go to the Greyhounds and that, and have a good night. You know, and the drinks are reasonable and. You meet other people there, and you have a bit of fun, and you go home at the end of the day, you haven't spent a fortune, and, you know, it's a good night out, and, uh, I wouldn't entertain fruit machines whatsoever. How about the internet? No, I'm not. I'll go on the internet to look up bits and pieces, but... With you wouldn't that, gamble on it? No, I'm not on there, and I wouldn't trust it. No. That's no. another factor, is trust. Mm. What do you trust? Who do you trust? And when you're using, when money's involved, can you afford to trust anybody? True. But, uh, like yourself, I'm just, you know, I'd try to go out and have a, on the Grand National, the Derby, or whatever, mm. down at the horses, or, and that's about, that, that's me gambling, that's all I do, and I wouldn't bother hoiding loads of money into a machine. Well, it's the last thing to do, I mean, if ever, as we all have been at some point, uh, you feel in the pinch and you're a bit broke, and you're not you're quite sure, you know, whether you're going to get through the week, the last thing to do is to go and have a bet. Brian, thank you very much for the call. Uh, that would be, well, it just would be stupid, wouldn't it? Uh, the chances of you winning are so slim that it's hardly worth considering. But that isn't the way, surely, to deal with your financial planning. Uh, I'm going to have a bet. I haven't got any money, but I'll have a bet. Um, how stupid is that? If you're having a bet, it's supposed to be for the fun and the entertainment. If it isn't, you got it wrong. 0 is the number. This is Talk Sport.
Another top talk sport summer day out in association with Werther's Originals and the Bradford Wooden Leg Company. Closed Saturdays. Roll up, roll up each weeknight from 10 and take a leisurely stroll down James Wales Adults Only End of the Pier Emporium. False breasts, fat ladies, and a t shirt that says Alien Conspiracy Novel. All the fun of the UK's favourite late night radio freak show. And that's even before we take any calls. <laughs> Yeah, Mrs. <laughs> One. James Wales, adults only pleasure beach. Here to visit before it gets washed away in a winter storm. Alternatively, listen across the UK weeknights from 10 on 10.89 and 10.53 a.m. Dogs Sport. I don't say, ooh, Mrs. It doesn't sound right. That's common. Indeed. Good morning. I'm, good evening. I'm Eddie, and this is Talk Sport. 0704 20 20 20 is our number. We started off talking about the relationship between gambling and the internet and what effect the internet has had on gambling. One of the things we've discovered early on was increase the number of people who gamble uh, because they can gamble anonymously and they can gamble without any clothes on, if you like. You don't have to get dressed up to go out. You don't have to socialise with anybody. If you've got a computer, you've got a credit card, you're a gambler. Or you can be. One thing we learned earlier is that women have become more inclined to have a bet, a flutter, a little go, than they would otherwise have done. Who, and who amongst us really wants to go into a betting job anyway? Not the most pleasant experience of your life. So, if, as most women are, a bit concerned about going in a room full of smelly men smoking their heads off, um, it's easy to sit at home and play on the computer, then why not? Well... Why not is what we're really trying to discover. Uh, Tom is in Derby. Tom, good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Good evening, Mike. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking the call. Uh, I've got two points, really. Uh, the first one is basically about the uh, super casinos uh, that the government are thinking about opening up and all the... Well, two jags is, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, uh, and all the nonsense about that. Do you know you can actually go into any of the high street... Uh, bookmakers at the moment and they'll have a row of about three or four machines where you can actually play roulette on them uh, up to a hundred pounds a spin and I've actually stood there and watched one fellow put through about eight hundred pounds in about six minutes Jesus. Uh, and you were talking about fighting over fruit machines earlier yeah, on yeah. Uh, and the fellow was wanting to run out to the bank to get some more money out mm. uh, and you can imagine that after about six minutes he's eight hundred pounds down uh, he's going absolutely crazy. The fella behind him was wanting to put some money in. And it's like, no, no, that's my machine. Mm. And I'm just thinking uh, the fact that they're all this for all about, you can't have a, you know, only, I think it's two super casinos they're thinking about opening in. At least with a super casino, uh, or a casino in general, it's like a night out, which you said earlier on, you know, the caller earlier on, you know, you go down to the dogs or you go down to horse racing, it's like a whole day out or an mm. evening out, uh, and that's that's when it's betting for fun. When you're standing in the bookies and some poor chap's 800 pounds down mm. uh, after six minutes, you know, there's no fun in that whatsoever. No, I mean, talking about the horse racing, and I'm not trying to promote it uh, beyond everything else, but to me it's a family day out. Yeah. You know, we, we take food and a picnic or whatever. <laughs> And we, you know, you sit on the grass and warm sunshine generally, and you watch the horses, which are fabulous animals. You see all the colours of the jockeys, and you, the crowd get excited, and you, you see the racing. And having a bet is is the last thing you do, but you may well do it, and there's no reason why you shouldn't. Yeah. We wouldn't take the family to the betting shop, would you? No. Uh, the, the, the one other point I was going to make was the... Uh, the chap that was on earlier that was in the industry uh, that was saying, you know, they've got this, you know, gamblers and on this telephone number up behind the, you know, on the m machines and leaflets and goodness knows what else nowadays. You know, surely that, though, is like saying to a drunk, uh, you know, there's warnings up behind the bar or someone that smokes yeah, on yeah, the scrap yeah, packets. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't really wash to be perfect. Well, I suppose it gets them around the, the law in many ways, it helps them to get a licence in that they say to the licensing or regulatory bodies, uh, well, look, we put a warning on the machine, you know, what more can we do? Yeah. Uh, I suppose it's not 
change up another four hundred pounds for the fella that put in the machine. So I'm, I'm not blaming the people who make the machines. I think that's perfectly legitimate business. I'm not blaming the people who design the games. That's a perfectly legitimate business. The person I'm blaming is the one who. I don't know, can't stop themselves, or don't see why they should stop themselves. Yeah, but then, then you, the, the, the fellow was saying, you know, it's a bit of fun and whatever, and horse racing and dog racing and going to a casino, you know, that is a bit of fun. But if you're putting these machines in, you know, pubs that pay out £200 or whatever, or, or in bookmakers, you know, where you can have a £100 bet and it lasts you like one spin of the wheel, mm. uh, then it's purely, you know, that bookmaker... Or, or pub trying to, or pub chain rather than a pub, uh, just purely trying to uh, make money out of that. Yeah, but you don't have to do it. No, but that's... There's nobody that's, saying to you, I'm going to treat you or I'm going to No, but Mike, surely that's the same as saying that, uh, you know, you don't have to drink and drive. People drink and drive. No, you no. don't have to speed. People speed. But that, I mean, that's a totally, I mean, that's, the analogy is totally wrong. You are not forced by someone saying, you must have a bet because of the machine there. Yeah, but at least with uh, people drinking too much, the bar staff have got the right to serve around the Exactly. Say, no, we're not serving you anymore, you're so, drunk. But I agree with you to the point where I do, and I think they should be, uh, incumbent upon the people in bookmaker shops to say to somebody, look, and, and the guy said this may well come in, you've lost 600 quid already, are you sure you want to go on? Yeah, but then you, <laughs> I suppose you've got the chap saying that it's lost 600 pounds, uh, thinking, uh, as that other chap said earlier on, where it's so addictive that, uh, you know, it's going to pay out in a minute, it's going to pay out in a minute, and yeah. if the fellow turns around and doesn't give him the change or whatever, he's going to flip his lid or... And, uh, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for the call. I mean, there is no answer to this. There's no right and wrong to this. If there was, it would have been solved years ago, long before you and I dis started to discuss it. But what we can discuss is the width and the depth of it, the changes to it, the encouragements and the inducements you get to have a bet. Um, is the pressure all on you? Is it unfair? Are you being unfairly pressurised into having a bet? I don't think you are. But then... In my perspective, you're not. I mean, if you don't want to read the blurb that somebody shoves in your hands, oh, I have a bet on this, you can't possibly lose. Um, you know, Mr. X from wherever it was won a million pounds just by saying yes to this or no to that. Well, if you're prepared to read that sort of crap and, and believe it, then, then you really are just a, a patsy for the bookies, aren't you? But does that make you wrong? Is there something that should be done to protect you? I'm not sure there is anything that can be done. You have to learn to protect yourself. Uh, Bruce is in Connorsbury, wherever that is. Hello. Uh, hello, Bruce. Good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Hello, Mike. Hi. How are you? Bruce, what's on your mind? Good evening. Just a bit of a story. Um, I must say that you've got some great callers on tonight regarding um, gambling. Mm. I'm not a gambler, but um, I got a bit of a rock in the other week by speaking to fast, so I'll just speak slowly. Um, there's a guy that I met down in a place called Marlborough in Wiltshire that went to put a bet on a horse um, that was, it was 93 to 1 by his the, uncle. And, yes, um, yeah, there's no such odds as 93 to 1. There was an 88, and uh, rather than go put the bet on, he, he went to the pub, had a few pints, he, he didn't put the bet on, and, and he came in first, and he got thrown out from his house. Mm. Because his uncle didn't win. Yeah. Thank you very much for the call. That was, uh, I'm sure that uh, was wonderful for you. Uh, I wish it were the same for the rest of us. Um, which it wasn't. Uh, Bernie, good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Good evening, Mike. Hi. You're in Wimbledon, aren't you? I'm in Wimbledon, yeah. Yeah, all right. Good evening to you. Good evening. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories about. Uh, um, Not a 93 to 1 show, is it? In the Bahamas and in, uh, in Las Vegas. Right. Um, I got a job, as I went after a job as a cashier about 35 years ago, and it turned out to be in a casino in the Bahamas. And as the money was money being paid was about four times what I was getting in London, I took the job and ended up working in one of the big casinos in, in, um, in the Bahamas, Grand Bahama Island. And I quickly learned there that um, uh, the machines are fixed to pay out at a certain rate. Um, now, unfortunately, unfortunately, for people living on the island, you weren't allowed to gamble. Uh, my wife came into the casino one day to see me, and she walked past the slot machines and idly put a 25-cent um, uh, piece in. 
and hit the jackpot. Mm -hmm. And you, you've never seen anybody so embarrassed in their life. You know, she couldn't stop the money coming out. It, it, it's quite a funny. And what sort of what sort of um, rate would that be? I, I have no idea. So. Well, you have no idea how much she won. Oh, how much she won? Yeah, she, yeah. she won o over forty dollars. All right. Yeah, yeah. Over forty dollars. Because I'm, um, I'm told, I'm told that the machines are fixed at something around eighty-six percent. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So they, they pay out fourteen. Yeah. It, it, var it varies from casino to casino. Um, when we go to Las Vegas, and we have been a number of times over the years, um, we, we have a sort of system that uh, we go into a casino, and we're not we're not big spenders. We we buy a roll of, uh, of five cent pieces, a two dollar roll of five cent pieces. So that gives you 45 cent pieces, and we each take 20, and we sit at different machines, and we play them. Now, you can go into one casino, and you can play that dollar each, and you can be in there for half an hour, an hour even, and you win a little, you lose a little, you win a little, you lose a little, you might win a lot, and you still put the money back in again. You go to a different casino, and that, that, that dollar can be gone in Where's this three, this three, four, three or four minutes. But I'm, I'm, I'm moving on. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was, that was a very exciting call um, about you and your wife's lifestyle. A dollar each at different casinos. And I'm afraid it was too exciting for me. Uh, Joe is in Southampton. Joe, good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Good evening, Mike. Uh, just a couple of quick points, um, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to pull you up because you have fallen for the industry's line Hello. on. People must know how much they can afford to lose. Yeah. That's completely wrong. What people need... I haven't cut you off, Joe, so please let me hear what you have to say. Yes, yes. No, people need to know how much they can afford to win. By that I mean, if you arrive at a race course with a thousand pounds, and you make yourself a hundred quid on that, ten percent is very, very good. Mm -hmm. I am a pro punter, and I'm quite happy to make ten percent a day. Yeah. On, on my investment. Um, every day I meet people who tell me they won't put a fiver on an even money shot because they don't want to win five pounds. When I tell them that they're in effect doubling their money, they see it in a different light. That's what the industry, they want you to try and win the million and stuff like that. Because if you just took a little bit off them every yeah, time... But what, the point that you missed is that you do it for a living, I do it for a bit of fun. I don't, I'm not interested in doubling my money on a fiver. i much rather put one pound on a hundred to one shot and hope it gets in the first three <laughs> than a fiver. Bookmakers. Well, may, may, bookmakers. Maybe it is, but I can afford to lose that comfortably and I get my bit of fun out of it. I don't care if the bookie makes a profit, I don't go there to make a profit, which is the point you're missing. I go oh. there for the entertainment. Oh, can I be your bookie then? Because I'd like to make your profit. By all, by all means, you'll get about four bets a year. You'll have to live on jam sandwiches. That's thank fair you. enough. Joe, thank you for the call. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's an entirely different mindset. Professional gambler, yeah. Double your money is great. But if you're only going for a bit of fun, you're going three times a year. Um, you ain't exactly going to get rich out of me. Or anybody else come to that. Mark, good evening. You're on Talk Sport. Uh, good evening, Mike. Yes, sir. Are you, you might remember me from Holland Park. I don't remember anybody from Holland Park. No, What's I your point? You I used to go to the snooker club in Shepherd's Bush. And uh, I used to work in, over at Gloucester Road as a carpenter. And the one day I was walking from Gloucester Road, walking along Kens and High Street. Can you get the story brief? We've I got 30 seconds. Quick anyway. I got a, someone was pipping a horn at Saturn and Rolls Royce, the, the owner of the snow club. He, and he said, Mark, you're ex forces. Can you, can you give me an hand for a minute? I said, What's that? He got his briefcase. Little Come on, very briefly. Four hundred thousand pounds he paid out on a bill for a casino in Kensington yeah. High Street. Yeah. And I went in. I said, what, "What? What's in here?" And he opened it up in the office. And I said, "What's that?" He said, "It's a betting bill." I said, four hundred thousand pounds." He opened it up in front of me, and the the, the fellow in the office turned around and said, "Right, I said, that's it." It was an Arab fellow, lovely bloke. Yeah. And uh, I said, you've lost that in one go. There you go, and that's so of you. You lost the opportunity to tell us a story which I'm sure was important to you and may well have been to us. But we didn't have time for you to get to it. This is Talk Sport. <laughs>
Good evening, I'm Mike Dickin. This is Talk Sport. We've been talking and we'll continue to, if you want to, about gambling, the internet and the ramifications of all that. But I'd also like to talk to you about, if you're a little taller, a little larger than the average man or woman in this country, aren't you sick to death of going into clothes shops and being made to feel like a freak? The shop assistants are downright rude, the clothes don't fit you, and you're made to feel stupid. I'll name the stores if you like. This is Talk Sports. 9 and 10, 53 a.m. He didn't falsify and he didn't invent. Around the world. There is only one real piece. Around the clock. From the Sky News Centre. Talk Sports on the hour news. The top story is from the Sky News Centre at midnight. On 10.89 and 10.53 a.m. Mike Dickin on Talk Sport. So much to talk about, so little time. Good morning, I'm Mike Dickin. This is Talk Sport. Uh, we'll continue, just for as long as you want to. Uh, and I'd like to, as much as you do, about the gambling and the relationship between gambling and the internet and how much easier it is now for those who don't want to go out, don't want to get involved, don't want to be in a social group of any sort, just want to have a gamble. Very easy. Sit in the nude at your computer with your credit card to hand and away you go. Some are literally going away for a long time. Uh, one young man went up a debt of £158,000 in just 55 minutes. Not his money. His parents' money. He had borrowed, and I use the word advisedly, their credit card. <laughs> and max them all out. He lost £158,000. He couldn't have done that under any other circumstances, could he? There's no way he could have gone into a, a betting shop or any other emporium where gambling takes place and been allowed to take part in that way. First of all, the cars weren't his, and he clearly was out of control. Is there no responsibility on the staff of such organisations to say to someone, look, pal, we're happy to take your money, but don't you think we had enough for today? As they're obliged to, when people get rather too keen on having a drink when they've already had far too many already. I don't know if you could work that, or if it's fair, but with fruit machines, if the fruit machine can identify the player, and um, knows that the player is the same one that started, what, five minutes ago, could it not be... Perhaps just a reminder, maybe we sh shouldn't be nannying people like this, but some people seem to need it. Say, so you've been on the machine five minutes, you've lost 25 quid, do you really want to go on? Little flashing light on the screen? I don't know. It's just a thought. I'd like to hear yours. 08704 20, 20, 20 is the number. And also, if you're a little taller than the average, if you're a little heavier than the average, in fact, if you're not Mr. or Mrs. Average, Clothing stores just don't want to know you, do they? Particularly the major ones. The major chain stores are the main offenders, as far as I'm concerned. I visited three very well-known household name chain stores in Bristol on Thursday, attempting to buy something as complex as a shirt with an 18 and a half or a 19-inch collar. None of them had any. It wasn't they sold out... They didn't stock them, and none of the sales staff could give a damn. So I telephoned the branches of these three uh, shops, stores, whatever you like to call them, in other towns, and found the same thing to be true. It is indeed policy. They don't stock anything over a size 18 collar. Now, according to uh, a gentleman's wear friend of mine who sells stuff like this, 18 is the average. And in consequence, it is ridiculous not to sell anything over the average. I wish I'd have been near his store at the time. He stocks them up to 24 or so. So where, where are those of us who don't fit the Mr. or Mrs. Average mould supposed to buy clothes off the peg? Do we really have to have everything made to measure? Being racist, sexist or ageist is against the law. So isn't being sizist against the law as well, or should it be? And where the hell do these companies recruit their staff? Their attitude beggars belief. Their couldn't care less attitude is surely without equal. The companies spend millions on advertising, 
but clearly nothing on staff selection or training. Have you been made, made to feel like a freak because you're not average? You might be smaller, but most imp often I think it's larger. Because if you're smaller, you can get the kids' clothes or whatever it is. Or you can get a size down, but you can't get a size up. I'll name the stores if we need to. All three of them in that massive shopping mall on the edge of Bristol. All three of them extremely rude. Without exception, the sales assistants were as rude as I've ever met anywhere. And I was made to feel like a freak for asking for a collar size over 18. We don't stop them, we don't sell them. But if you want to go and choose the colour of shirt you want, we'll have it ordered in specially for you. It'll be a week to ten days. Well, you can imagine what my answer was. You can't. You haven't been listening to the programme long enough. 08704-202020 is our number. If you'd like to talk about that, then please do. And it wasn't just because it was Bristol, by the way. As I said, we phoned their stores in other towns. I was so angry. And found that this is the policy nationwide. They don't deserve to trade, in my humble opinion. Uh, however, other matters. Steve is in London. Steve, good morning. You're on Talk of Sport. Uh, hello there. Good morning. Good morning to you. Yeah, I was just talking about the uh, the internet, basically. Yeah. Um, I was um, on it one day, gambling, um, watching it on the telly, and didn't realise how much I'd done until Monday morning when I got phoned up by the bookmaker. And he said to me, do you realise you've lost two and a half grand? <laughs> yeah, that's my exactly... Um, yeah, that's what I happened, I just thought, oh my good god. Um, and then, but why didn't they say halfway through when I got to a grand? I suppose no. you're expected to keep a check of your own spending. What were you doing? Horse racing? Yeah, horse racing, then I moved on to uh, dog racing, because, you know, the old satellite stations, you can just watch it live in your house. Yeah. Don't, don't have to go to the smelly, disgusting betting shop, which I don't like with the smoke, cause I hate smoking. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's convenient, but... Do you, do you play cards on the internet? No, I don't do cards. I don't, I'm not being funny, I don't understand it. So, if I don't understand it, I don't play it. Right. You didn't seem to understand the horse racing too well, if you lost two and a half grand. Well, I've got, I've got it wrong, didn't I? You know, but n next next couple of weeks I won two grand. They so, still let you go on? Yeah, still let me go on, yeah. Because the, the week later, I, I had a 16 to 1 winner, I had a £50 each way on that. And then I did a lucky 15 and I got four winners on that, so I got another grand back. But in the end, the bookmaker wins. So that's all I wanted to say, really. Well, I'm amazed. I mean, you, you gamble to win, don't you? Well, all gamblers gamble to win. Yeah. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm going to... The argument I had with a professional gambler earlier, he, he reckons, I said it was ridiculous, to go to a, a, a horse race meeting, yeah. see the odds on favourite, or the even money favourite, yeah. and put a fiver on it. Because the chances are fairly high it's going to win, that's what the even money <laughs> means. So you, you give the bookie your fiver, the horse wins, and he gives you your fiver back plus another fiver. So you made a 100%, but yeah. actually you've only made a fiver. Um, I got no fun out of that at all. I would quite, I'm much happier to go to the horse race meeting and pick up, as I did the other week, 150 to one shot. And I had a pound each way on it, because I'm last of the big spenders. <laughs> and it came in second. Yeah. And I got, what is it, 37 and a half to one on it or something. So I ended up with 40 quid. For a pound. And I was, what? It was, I thought I won the lottery. But it wasn't the winning the money. It was watching a horse that they thought was 150 to 1 chase the favourite home in a, in a very close finish. Yeah. And I thought, so I, I, I wanted to turn to the bookies and say, you underrated that horse, you pillocks. But it, it was almost a V sign to the bookies. It was the fun of watching that horse run so well. It wasn't, it wasn't the money. Well, that may be different because, I mean, if you go to a betting shop, how many... Uh windows are there to take money than to pay out. I don't know. Well, there's normally one paying out window, so about three taking money. That should tell you all you need to know, shouldn't it? Exactly. Thank, thank you very much for the call. Uh, on the other subject of clothing, let's just talk over Karen in Leeds. Karen, good morning. Um, 
Yeah, um, I'm uh, rather large. I'm like size 20. Um, and I've got a friend who's a size 12. And when we go shopping together, um, obviously we're going to the shops where she gets her clothes from. And so the staff just look at you, you know, like you're some kind of leper, like you don't belong in there. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, you get dirty looks from them. And if you dare to ask if they do have to happen to have anything in your size, it's like, uh, what on earth are you asking for? Um, and also, I, I find another thing is in the shops that you can get bigger sizes in. Um, I mean, I'm only 28, um, and they're not, like, uh, n not trendy, trendy. Not exactly but, fashionable, no. No, you know, you, I've got to dress, um, no offence to all people, but like an old person at 28 if yeah. I want bigger sizes. Why can't they see this? I mean, is it because they're... All fashion chains and shops are run by little trendy Wendy's who really don't know they're from their elbow uh, uh, and have no idea what happens in the real world. I mean, if you look at the models on the catwalk, they're all stick thin. They look emaciated and ill. I mean, how people say these models look attractive has been a matter of concern to me for years. They look remarkably ill to me. The clothing looks dreadful on them. But they all crowd round and congratulate each other on some garish concoction that somebody called, I don't know, some famous name is wearing. You, you're never going to see that on the street in a million years. I think um, it's, it's quite alarming. Um, I mean, there's websites now, you know, um, telling teenage girls how to be anorexic. No, I know, we've done and, that. You know, if this is the if this is the way our kids have been brought up, that you've got to be thin. Well, it, um, it's, uh, it is part of the argument, but I'm I'm not exactly thin, but then I'm not exactly gross. And um, I was going to a special event, and I, as always, I was careless, and I spilled some coffee down my shirt. And I thought, oh damn, I'll just pop in. I'll tell you where it was. I'll pop into Marks and Spencers. Yeah. And I'll buy a shirt. So I went into Marks and Spencer's, and I went to men's department, as you would, and I found a man in a suit, and I thought, he must be serving. And I said, good morning, I want a shirt, anything over 18 neck, please. Over 18? I said, yeah, he said, we don't stock anything over 18. I said, no, don't be silly, you must have a shirt with a bigger neck than an 18. We certainly do not. I said, well, this is the men's, I'm not in the boys' bit, am I? He said, no, this is the men's wear department. Um, and I said, well, tell me where I can buy a shirt. Well, then